geomaterials such as sediments and rocks have a yield criteria which is stress sensitive. Before getting into the equations of these yield criteria, let's explore first the physical mechanisms behind. These geomaterials are stress sensitive because of frictional strength. And this is the same physics that applies to this block sliding on a surface with a friction in between those surfaces. The force that I need, FT, lateral force, in order to slide that box on top of a surface is proportional to the normal force applied on the block and also proportional to the friction coefficient. The larger the friction coefficient and the larger the normal stress, the higher is going to be the lateral force I need in order to slide that block. And that is related to the shear stress that develops on this interface that uh, is going to either prevent the block from moving or let it move at a certain force once that strength is uh, overcome. Let's apply the same physics and the same mechanism to granular materials. So let's imagine that now instead of a block sliding on a surface, we have a granular material which is composed of grains. And these grains are, um, are packed in such a way that they are uh, touching each, each other. Let me add uh, one more layer of grains. They are packed and they are touching it, each other at the contacts because I have the action of a external effective stress acting on them. This external effective stress is similar to our stress or our force Fn in the block. The question here is going to be how much stress can I put in one direction? How much bigger can it be compared uh, to the stress that I have on the other side in perpendicular direction. And let's say that these are principal stresses and this is sigma 3 in effective stress and this is sigma 1. The question here is how much larger sigma 1 can be depending on sigma 3. And I hope that you can see that that's going to be a function of the frictional strength grain to grain. Why? Because if we get into the at the microscopic scale, this stress is going to apply a normal stress from grain to grain at the contact. And depending on that normal stress, that normal stress together with the friction coefficient is going to set the required shear stress in order to move this grain with respect to each other. If I had a friction coefficient equal to zero from grain to grain, then uh, this would be like a fluid and it wouldn't be possible to have a sigma one different than sigma three. However, if this is a material that has a friction coefficient, then I'm going to have shear stresses at the contacts between grains. All right, so, uh, let's see how this works now in our equations. And in order to do that, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use a more circle where we have our shear stress in the y-axis, our effective normal stress in the x-axis. And according to the frictional law that I have 
written before, I can relate the maximum shear stress to the effective normal stress through the friction coefficient. And for a constant friction coefficient, that's just the equation of a line. And let's bring now the more circle into the picture. And let's say that we fix a given stress sigma 3. Let me do this with the red color. So it mimics the color over there. We have a given effective stress sigma 3. It's a normal stress and it's a principal stress. The question is how much can be sigma 1? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start drawing uh, small circles more circles that I'm going to keep increasing sigma 1. For example, the first circle I could draw is this one, where sigma 1 is going to be here. But uh, I'm still far from the, from the yield line or from the shear line, so I could increase this more circle and eventually get to the value for which the more circle touches the shear envelope. And the shear failure line. Let me try one more time with this more circle. So it actually looks like a circle. Okay, that's a little bit better. And let me get rid of the other more circles. I'm just going to use a more circle of failure. This is the maximum stress sigma 1 that I can apply on this granular material. Uh, so that I get to the onset of failure and uh, I just have this point touching the shear failure line. Okay, so at this particular point then, I'm going to have a condition in which the shear stress is going to be equal to the, fr the friction coefficients times the normal stress. So at this particular point, I have a state of stress which is sigma n and tau given by this equation uh, over there. All right, let's try to find out uh, what is the, this value of sigma 1. What is the possible value of sigma 1 based on the friction coefficient? Notice that the bigger the friction coefficient, the higher is going to be this slope and the bigger could be this more circle could be. All right, so in order to do that, we're going to find the center of this more circle. Let's say that center is over there. Uh, this more circle is also going to have a radius and we're going to call that radius R and the center is uh, right here. Also, uh, since I'm dealing here with a geometrical problem, I'm going to make use of this angle which is called the friction angle where the tangent of the friction angle is equal to the friction coefficient. Notice that that angle is the same as this angle over here and because this point is a tangent point um, in the circle to this line, therefore this angle has to be a right angle or 90 degrees. And this angle over here is going to be 1 minus the friction angle and this angle over here is going to be the friction angle. This is just because of the properties of the this right uh, triangle. Okay, so uh, let's write based on the friction angle, the center and the radius, what is sigma 1 and what is sigma r. Sigma 1 is going to be equal to the, is right here, is going to be the center plus the radius and uh, sigma 3 is going to be equal to the center minus the radius because it's right there, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the ratio of these two 
and find out what that ratio can be. Notice that the radius is a function of, uh, but actually both, the center and the radius are functions of the sigma 1 and, uh, and sigma 3. Uh, but all right, let me continue with this equation. Sigma 1 over sigma 3 is equal to the here the center, but uh, the radius um, from, as you can see from this uh, right triangle, and because of the properties of this right triangle, uh, here the sine of this angle is going to be R over C right again this is these are just trigono trigonometric properties and therefore if r is going to be c times the sine of phi and therefore i'm going to have the following i'm forgetting the c over here the sine of phi times c and uh, if i divide everything by c the center is going to cancel out and I find that the stress anisotropy ratio sigma 1, sigma 3, its maximum value is going to be given by 1 plus the sine of the friction angle divided 1 minus sine of the friction angle. And uh, if I know what is sigma 3, I know what is sigma 1. Uh, for example, typical friction angles are in the order of 30 degrees and for a friction angle of uh, 30 degrees, the friction coefficient is about 0.6 and uh, the sine of 30 degrees is 0.5. So this anisotropy ratio is equal to 1.5 divided 0 0.5 is equal to 3. Uh, this anisotropy ratio actually is sometimes also called and uh, with the parameter Q. So for this friction angle, Q is going to be equal to the number three. What means that the maximum stress anisotropy possible for this friction angle, and uh, for that friction coefficient between grain to grain is three. The maximum effective vertical stress cannot be th three times larger than the least principal stress and that's what fixes the diameter of the Mohr circle. Uh, let me mention one more thing over here and uh, uh, probably you have seen this before that uh, in, in geomaterials, in rocks, in sands when they are failed usually we run this type of failure if we do it in the laboratory and the conditions in which if this is sigma 1 it's going to go in the longer direction of the sample and sigma 3 is going to be perpendicular to that this is what we call an effective confining stress and if we were to get to the, the limit of failure, the material would fail at the characteristic angle. That characteristic angle, let me actually start it from here from the corners. So I simplify my drawing. And this characteristic angle is related to this point over here through the Mohr circle and is equal to this angle divided by 2. And that angle divided by 2, notice that this is 90 degrees, and this is a friction angle, uh, so that this plane is going to be at 45 degrees plus the friction angle divided by 2, where the angle is measured from the plane in which the maximum stress is applied. In this case, sigma 1, sigma 1, the Mohr circle represents all the state uh, 
of stress is possible in this solid and the one that fails is that point over there that physically means this plane uh, over here and when I do have failure then this top part is going to move with respect to the lower part okay so uh, we have seen that just introducing a friction coefficient uh, has uh, made this type of material uh, to resist a longer a higher shear stress with a higher effective normal stress and that's part of the stress sensitivity the same thing is going to apply for example to a fractured rock with fractures in all directions is if all those fractures uh, do not have any tensile strength if uh, the fractures are, are not holding uh, each other without any cementation the same principle is going to apply what is going to hold that fractured rock together is the friction between the surfaces all right so we have seen the case for materials which are uncemented let's extend this type of failure criterion to a material which is cemented and then we'll go into analyzing this case in three dimensions okay uh, let's use again the more circles an uncemented material is characterized by having a yield failure that goes through the intercept where if the effective normal stress is equal to zero the material shouldn't be able to resist any shear stress so a shear failure like this one where tau is equal to mu times sigma n is what would represent a non-cemented stress sensitive material with a friction coefficient if we do have cementation then the shear failure line is going to look slightly different there is just going to be an offset at the origin and the equation is going to be to have that offset which is actually called cohesive strength and it's going to be the cohesive strength plus the friction coefficient times sigma n notice that despite the cementation the material still holds its frictional strength so don't think that that the cementation is going to get rid of the frictional strength the frictional strength is still there and uh, usually in order to to measure this type of uh, of strength uh, and shear strength uh, what we do is a, a slightly different uh, analysis o of course you know you could measure the always draw the more circles and find what is the more circles that uh, the language is tension to do all those more circles of failure uh, so that you obtain your your failure strength but alternatively what you can do and it's a little bit easier is to work in a slightly different a, a system of coordinates in which instead of working with more circles and effective normal stress and shear stress we can also do exactly the same analysis but uh, using the least effective principal stress and the maximum effective principal stress at failure or yield so you see that now what i'm doing is uh, let me come back over here to my touch screen okay here i am is to use a the principal stresses in order to tell if the the rock is going to fail or not and a non-cemented material as we have seen before is going to have a failure criterion which uh, goes again through the origin of the coordinate system at zero zero no effective uh, least stress 
uh, no possible stress in the other direction where sigma 1 maximum is equal to q times sigma 3 this is the equation that we have right over here and if we do have cementation then the equation changes by adding a constant where let me before writing the constant let's uh, try to get this uh, from uh, uh, properties that probably you already know if my effective stress radial stress is equal to zero and I apply the stress in the perpendicular direction the maximum stress that the rock can take under unconfined conditions is going to be a point along this line and it's that point and it is what the, is called unconfined compression strain UCS let me write that again Unfun unconfined compression strength that's the intercept over here and the equation is sigma 1 is equal to the intercept of the y-axis UCS plus Q times sigma 3 so it's a simple extension uh, similar to what uh, we had uh, before and uh, as I was telling you uh, working either in uh, in this system or in that system is exactly the same uh, working in this system is a little bit easier because uh, while in this system for example if you have like a more circle over here and a more circle over there and another more circle over here uh, you will have to fit the line which is the tangent to those more circles in this case it is a little bit easier because instead of more circles you are just going to have for a given value of sigma 3 its maximum value of sigma 1 and and so on so it's much easier to fit a line to a set of points than to fit a line to be tangent to circles that's why this one is a little bit easier uh, to use but uh, probably uh, you're interested in knowing how we uh, go from this one to that one and it's uh, it's pretty straightforward we already saw the equation that links uh, q and the friction angle but uh, let me uh, write those again and uh, and share that with you uh, i'm bringing my internet browser in here and these are the equations that we need the friction coefficient you can calculate that directly through Q where as we can see mu is equal to Q minus 1 divided square root of 2 no it was 2 times square root of, of Q 2 times square root of Q and the, the cohesive strength is linked through the uh, UCS through this equation UCS 2 times S0 square root of Q 2 times S0 square root of Q so uh, if you find your UCS and your Q as your fitting parameters then you can uh, get from here the cohesive strength and also the friction coefficient in, in this other space all right so let's go now with the, the knowledge that we have uh, after that the, the last thing we're going to do is uh, how to measure this in practice but uh, now that we have this knowledge uh, and before going into the practice and getting uh, into those details let's see how we can expand these to three dimensions and if you remember we have seen the already the the Tresca and the bone misses uh, criteria that were stress insensitive right so 
basically what we're going to do now is to, to add the stress sensitivity. And uh, you'll see this fairly easy. All right. We have seen in the previous lecture that a yield criterion can be written in terms of the first invariant of the stress tensor and the second invariant of the deviatoric stress tensor, a J2. A yield criterion which is just a constant and it doesn't depend on the value of I1 is something which is called and stress insensitive insensitive uh, stress uh, criterion. However, uh, we have seen that now that the larger the normal stress, effective normal stress, or the larger the least effective stress, the stronger a uh, material could be. So what we see now is that uh, we cannot uh, always have a flat line in this region and in the extension to 3D now I could have a failure criterion in which the second invariant of the deviatoric stress tensor at failure is a function of the first invariant through a constant and this should be an uncemented material or I could also have a criterion that goes into tension and that at a, a the invariant I1 equal to zero, it has a, a some value which is not zero. And we have extended now these to three dimensions because uh, the only thing I did was to, instead of talking about uh, just a, a 2D more circle, I extended the discussion to J2 and I1 that considers uh, the state of stress in three dimensions. And let's go now into the space of principal stresses and see how this look, how this is going to look. And let me go with that. This is also a difficult drawing. But let me give it a try. In the principal stress space, we have three principal stresses, not ordered in any particular order. And I have the hydrostatic axis, which is the axis at which sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2 and is equal to sigma 3. And now, around that axis, I'm going to have my uh, yield uh, surfaces that are going to be symmetric with respect to the hydrostatic axis. So, uh, let's go with the first one, in which we just limit J2. If you remember, J2 is what determines the distance from the hydrostatic axis to any point. And what we see, and let's make the case of a cemented material, so the intercept is going to be uh, in the negative side. Okay, let me clarify something. Uh, in this direction, I am in the direction of increasing compression. Uh, so the this area it gets larger as I go into more and more compression. And basically, this is yield surface is going to look like this. Looks like a cone in three dimensions. And the radius, maximum radius available of the cone depends on the effective uh, confining stress or the mean effective stress. The more I move into the compression, the larger it gets. And this type of yield criterion is what is known as the 
Drucker, Plugger, Yield Criterion. And it has an equation which is pretty simple and it's actually the same equation that we have over here in which the the, devi the second invariant of the deviatoric stress tensor is related through constants through the first invariant of the stress tensor and that's it that's all what you need that's what makes that surface you could also within this surface use and plot the what is called the modified Tresca criterion. If you remember, Tresca criterion look like an hexagon. Well, the modified Tresca also it's like an hexagon, but uh, the size of the hexagon uh, decreases as you go more and more into less compression. Or le let me rephrase that: as you increase the compression the size of the hexagon uh, gets larger and this is modified Tresca and the equation for modified Tresca is that the difference between the stresses the maximum principal stress and the least principal stress also is, is related through constants uh, with an equation of a line to the mean stress. Mm -hmm. All right, but you know, in essence, it, they are they are very similar. And as as I was telling you before, uh, we tend to use yield criteria which are smooth on the surface because we're going to compute the derivative of of those surfaces or the tangent of those surfaces uh, later on in order to compute uh, plastic strains. So it's a much better option to go with the Dracker Prager model than with the modified Tresca. And uh, before we move on into uh, determining the parameters for the for the Coulomb failure criterion, actually I didn't tell you, uh, but this is a Coulomb failure criterion. And usually, since it is done with more circles by fitting more circles, it's uh, extended to the more Coulomb failure criterion but it's actually Coulomb which came out uh, with this law. Okay, so uh, I wanted, okay, the last thing I wanted to do here is to tell you that if we combine the more Coulomb criterion with the Drucker Prager criterion, so more Coulomb plus Drucker Prager is going to define what are C3 and C4. C3 is going to be equal to 6 times the cohesive strength times the cosine of the friction angle divided square root of 3 times 3 sine of the friction angle. Uh, that's going to be our cohesive strength in the space of the Drucker Prager model. And C4 is going to be equal to 2 divided square root of 3 times the sine of the friction angle divided 3 minus the sine of the friction angle. Okay, so we, together with the more Coulomb criterion, and then uh, we can extend this to the Drucker Prager criterion, and, and you see how it works. And now you see the difference between a stress sensitive and a stress insensitive uh, yield criterion. The last thing that we're going to do is to, um, to explain how we measure some of, of these uh, parameters. And, uh, and then we have a, um, a, a one uh, further discussion about uh, uh, some other types of, uh, of failure criteria that are a little bit more adva advanced. And uh, we'll, we'll do that uh, quickly. Okay, so how do we measure the, these values sigma 1 and sigma 3? Uh, how do we apply 
a value of an effective stress on, on a rock. And doing an unconfined compression test like this one, it is fairly easy, but adding compression is, uh, is not that, uh, that easy. For that, what we usually do is uh, we use what is called a triaxial uh, cell. And in a triaxial uh, cell, we run what are called triaxial tests. And for this case, we're going to use what is known as the axisymmetric triaxial cell that uses cylindrical samples. We're going to see later on that sometimes uh, we might not be fully characterizing a rock by using this type of experiment, but let's go step by step. In the triaxial test, what we do is uh, to apply stresses to a rock through a membrane like you see over here. Let me copy all of this and I'll explain what all of that uh, means. All right, so if we had a rock, like for example this one, and now I'm adding the influence of the pore pressure, many times we do have to test these rocks with the resident original fluid, then I can apply a lateral stress, uh, which is applied by a fluid on a cylindrical sample, and that's why it's called axisymmetric, because we're using a cylindrical sample, through a confining fluid. That confining fluid applies a confining pressure that converts into a stress as it goes through the sample by having a membrane that separates the confining fluid from the pore fluid and doesn't let also the, the confining fluid to get into the rock because rocks are usually permeable so if we didn't have anything the fluid will get into it. And with the application of a confining pressure, we can increase uh, sigma 3 and also we increase usually sigma 1. In this type of triaxial cells, they, the rock and these, the top and um, bottom blocks, which are called end caps, they are usually all submerged into the confining fluid. So when you increase the pressure of the confining fluid, you are actually also increasing the stress in direction one, and, uh, and you are increasing the stress in all directions. In order to increase the stress just in one direction, we usually use a piston that comes here on top of the one of the end caps and applies in, ex, in a stress on the axial direction so that that stress increases and eventually fails the rock. Let me show a picture, and uh, it's actually a diagram of what a triaxial cell looks like. And it's something like this, where you have your rock, you have your confining fluid, that confining fluid is pressurized by using uh, pumps that confine the fluid, and you have a vessel that prevents the fluid uh, from escaping so that you build up a, a pressure inside and externally by means of a piston you can apply an external stress that is going to load and add stress in the axial direction to be different than in the radial uh, direction. Okay, in this particular case, in this example, the stress is being applied externally and uh, the stress is also measured externally and let me come back over here uh, what that means is that there are some devices in which you measure the total stress outside the cell and that is s1 and there are some other devices in which you measure the difference in stress with the load cell which is inside the cell if a load cell is inside the cell let me come back to 
to here, uh, let's imagine that, that this ball is a, a load cell. The load cell is not going to be affected by the confining pressure. So the only thing that is going to measure is the difference between the axial stress and the radial stress. And there are different kinds of triaxial cells. Some measure the total external stress, axial stress. Some others, they measure the differential axial stress, S1 minus S3. So with all these variables, S1, S3, which is equal to the confining pressure, the pore pressure, I can calculate what are the effective stresses that correspond to a particular test and I can summarize all of that data into a plot of sigma 1 a failure as a function of the sigma 3 prescribed and I can obtain what is the law that characterizes the shear strength of a material. Let me emphasize here that this is the sigma 1 at failure or at yield. All right, uh, let me see if I'm forgetting anything from this section. Um, I don't think so, I don't think so, but um, but just uh, one, one more comment in this section is that uh, we usually uh, need to use the confining fluids in rocks in order to measure their strength and to expose them to the right environment. But uh, usually that fluid, it, if it doesn't react chemically with the rock, it doesn't have an impact on the strength of the rock. You can run tests at different pore pressures and eventually the strength of the rock is going to be only characterized by the effective stress, not by the total stress and the value of pore pressure. So you can see in this case that you have a test conducted at, uh, at different pore pressures going from zero to about uh, more than 100 MPa, but they all collapse into one line when uh, you write that in terms of effective stresses. Okay, um, we have then uh, seen how uh, to characterize uh, this stress insensitive, uh, uh, stress sensitive uh, yield criteria. And uh, just uh, uh, one more th uh, thing that we have to do here is uh, uh, first, uh, let's try to solve the problem that is inherent to the Mor-Coulomb criterion. As you can see, the Mor-Coulomb uh, criterion, uh, coming back over here, it relates uh, sigma 1 and sigma 3. And it's similar to Tresca in the sense that uh, the only way of telling you that um, that you have a failure is just by linking the values of the, the maximum principal stress and the least principal stress, both effective. And that's what Tresca was doing too. But we saw that the problem with Tresca is that it had some uh, particular sites in the yield criterion that uh, the, the, the derivative have uh, two answers depending on which direction you, uh, you go into that point. So uh, there is a solution for that and that's what is called the, the late criterion and the modified late criterion. And we'll see that the modified late criterion is also uh, going to to solve some other issues. Okay. The motivation then, uh, remember, is that uh, the Morcolom criterion is, uh, it has a similar problems to Tresca and modified Tresca. Uh, and let's see what the reason is. I'm going to introduce here a new type of uh, well, it's actually not, not, not a new type of plot, 
but it's a new point of view that is going to help us uh, see the use of the modified lay criteria. If you we have a principal stress space, we said that we have a hydrostatic axis, right? And we also said that here, for example, we could have a Drucker Prager criterion. Let me try again with a circle. And this Drucker Prager criterion uh, looks like a cone, but we could take a look at this cone uh, from a point of view from here, directly from where the hydrostatic uh, axis is. So if I were to look directly in the direction of the, let me try that eye one more time. All right, if I were to, to look in the direction of the hydrostatic axis, what I would see is actually something a little bit easier to to understand and this is what you would see these are the same axis that I have on the left let me make this a little bit longer sigma 1 sigma 2 and sigma 3. For the the Drucker Prager yield criterion what I see is a circle. Let me try to draw the circle. I need to be very precise now drawing this circle. So just give me a little bit more, a little bit of, of time and I'll, I'll do that. Okay, probably I have to redraw this later. But let me give it a first try with what you see over here. Okay, that's what I would see at a given value of mean stress. The more Coulomb criterion is going to, to look as follows. If, for example, I have uh, two of the stresses uh, which are the same, for example, sigma 1 and sigma 2, and just sigma 3, which is different to sigma 1 and sigma 2, I would be in the conditions of the triaxial cell that we have in here, right? Because in a radial stress, the two uh, horizontal stresses, if the sample is horizontal, are going to be the same, and the vertical stress is going to be different. So in that case, this in the in this type of diagram is going to mean that I'm going to be in a point somewhere over here, starting from the center. So the center here, I mean that point over there, where sigma one and sigma two are the same, but sigma three is uh, different. And this is what is called a path of triaxial compression. If I were to keep sigma 3 and sigma 2 the same and just increase sigma 1 until failure, I will get over here. And if I were to do the same in direction sigma uh, with sigma 1 and sigma 3 the same and increasing sigma 2, I will be somewhere over here. Let me change. I just noticed that my circle was too large in that direction. Uh, actually, let me write the draw the circle later. It's going to be easier if I do that. Okay. These three paths are what are called triaxial compression. And this is what is done usually in a triaxial test in which this stress is the same as this stress 
and I increase and fail the rock with in the axial direction. I could also have a, in a scenario in which what I do is something which is called triaxial extension and what you do is you fix your axial stress and you increase your radial stress until the rock fails by increasing the deviatoric stress. And this case of triaxial extension in, in this kind of plane is going to be a path in which you keep one of the stresses constant and you increase the other two. And it looks something like this. And it turns out with the more circle uh, criterion, actually with the more Coulomb criterion, the distance in the deviatoric plane is going to be shorter. And in all directions, it's going to be the same. And uh, it's going to be something more or less like this where this is the path to triaxial extension. If you join all of these dots together, uh, we will get the limiting surface in three dimensions of the Mohr Coulomb criterion, which looks like this. Now you see why I'm not drawing this in three dimensions, because it is, it is pretty difficult. And let me improve my drawing here. I realize I was too far in that direction and it's uh, more or less like this uh, where it's not an hexagon as in the modified Tresca it's actually uh, something uh, slightly different let me now add the the Drucker Prager so for the Drucker Prager then my distance from the center is going to be more or less over there this one is going to be more or less over here and over there. So the circle is going to be, it's going to represent the Drucker Prager criterion. And it's going to be uh, something like this. Uh, let me change colors. First, I wanted to write this is Drucker Prager, and this one is more Coulomb. Okay, uh, what do we do now? Uh, what we said that we have to do is to smooth this uh, criterion, the more Coulomb criterion. So I can take derivatives uh, at these points. And that's what the modified Lake criterion does. So it uses as a base the more Coulomb criterion, but smooths the values at the corners so that I get a function that has a continuous derivative in a space. And uh, this is the lake criterion, and it looks more or less like what I'm, I'm drawing right here. This is a challenging drawing as well. And of course, uh, we are going to need the, the equation for such criterion. I'm going to write this in a minute. The equation is going to use stress invariance. And for first time, we're going to use the, the third 
invariant of the stress tensor. So the function is going to look uh, is going to depend on the first invariant and on the third invariant. This is the general expression and the the actual expression for the modified uh, Lake uh, Lake criterion is the following. The stress in variant number one with a slight modification to the cube divided the third invariant uh, with a little modification is equal to 27 plus eta. Let's see what those modifications are. The first invariant, as we know, is the summation of principal stresses, but these principal stresses are modified a little bit, uh, effective stresses, of course. The third invariant is the product of the principal stresses, but uh, these ones are modified too, and uh, sigma, each of those modified principal stresses means the principal effective stress itself plus a parameter s that acts as a sort of uh, cohesive strength where s is equal to the cohesive strength measured through the Mohr Coulomb criterion divided the tangent of the friction angle. And uh, the last thing that we need is to define eta, eta or eta is equal to four times the tangent of the friction angle square times 9 minus 7 the sine of the friction angle divided 1 minus sine of the friction angle. And that's it. That's uh, everything you need in order to define this uh, modified uh, laid criterion. Uh, let me just do one minor fix over here before I finish the video. Uh, remember that here we have continuous derivatives and this is going to look more or less like this. where this is the value for the limit of triaxial extension. I leave to you as homework to verify why the triaxial extension path is shorter than triaxial compression, but uh, this is actually what uh, Mohr Coulomb predicts, and it's, uh, it's based on the definitions of the, the deviatoric, uh, the second invariant of the deviatoric uh, stress tensor. Okay, um, I think that's uh, everything that uh, I wanted to discuss in this uh, lecture. Uh, so we have covered the basis of the stress sensitive yield criteria and going into, into three dimensions. And uh, we have also seen how to expand this, not only from the Mohr Coulomb, uh, to the Mohr Coulomb criterion, but also to, to Drucker Prager, uh, which takes in, into account sensitivity but ignores the effects of triaxial compression and triaxial compression, triaxial compression and extension. And uh, we have seen how to extend this to the modified uh, lay criteria.